No one has shown more contempt for other nations and for the well-being of their own people than the depraved regime in North Korea. And then the next thing you know, you're on this travelator, and it's this travelator to nowhere. You're on a travelator for a good ten minutes, just going up with nobody talking. You know, or only in hushed whispers, perhaps. There's music playing in the background, and and then you have to go through um, through an air tunnel to depurify you. I mean, it's just it's it's bizarre. And then the next thing you know, you're in this red lit room, which is freezing cold because they do it to preserve the body. And there's a glass case in the middle, and and Kim Il Sung's in there, and there he is, draped in the Korean Workers' Party flag, and there's soldiers standing around with guns. In case anybody does something, then you have to bow uh, on on his left side, his right side, and behind his head. Not behind his uh, no, and behind in front of his feet, not behind his head. Uh, that because that apparently would be uh, a grave insult to the dear leader, the great leader. Sorry. And uh, and then you're out, and then you do the whole thing again for Kim Jong Il, just when you thought it was all <laughs> over. You do the whole thing again. Hello, and welcome to this terribly, awfully put together podcast. Hardly worth being called a podcast really, um, which is a recording of a conversation that I had with a friend of mine called Luke Pierce back in 2016 about his trip to North Korea. I've long been interested in North Korea and when I found out that a mate of mine went on holiday there, I just wanted to ask him every single question I could about what it was like and what the people were like there and the whole experience of it. So what follows is about an hour and a half of our conversation. I can't imagine it's going to be of interest to anybody apart from ultimate North Korean uh, geeks out there, but we hope it's of interest to couple of things just to say from the very beginning. First, it was recorded before we were properly aware of the awful, awful treatment and death of um, Otto Warmbier, the American who was taken captured, captive there and then was returned to his homeland in a very sad state and died soon after. We should have perhaps been um, aware of the likelihood of that when recorded. Perhaps that wasn't discussed with the um, appropriate amount of um, dignity and sympathy that it should have been. The only other thing to say is Luke had a cold as well, so forgive the sniffling throughout and and, uh, and my inane interjections. I hope you can hear it. I hope it works out. I hope it's of interest to you. This is My Mate Went on Holiday to North Korea. Perhaps we should start by telling people how we know each other, because we've known each other for kind of 10 years now, I guess, haven't we? Yeah. yeah. Um, so perhaps you take up the story. It would have been 2004 that we first met. 2004, we met, we arrived at King's College in Cambridge, and I suppose the very first time we would have met would have been having a drink together with our new director of studies and yeah. the, the politics cohort. We both studied what was then called social and political sciences. I certainly did politics throughout the whole degree. You did as well, I think, or...? I or studied, yes, I studied politics all the way through, but also some sociology as well. Uh -huh. Which meant I got to do courses about, um, you know, kind of e economic related courses and uh, stuff about the political economy of capitalism and things like that, as well as Japanese politics, which was which is probably my first introduction to North Korea. Actually, oh, really? Yeah. In terms of being an external threat to Japan. Or? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And then and then you went off and, and we left in two thousand and seven. Uh, we both moved to London. You went to work for TfL for a while. Yes, that's right. Uh, and now, perhaps you tell folk what you do now. Well, I had a very happy six and a half years working for TfL, uh, London Underground, uh, when it was a lot of fun. Uh, and towards the end of my time there, I'd set up a little online shop uh, with my parents called RadicalTetail.com, or the Radical Tetail Company. And uh, I decided that if I spent more time on this business, that we'd be able to grow it, and it would be actually a really fun thing to do uh, with my parents. And, uh, and these are wonderful because I bought them for Christmas presents for people. So they're kind of <laughs> suffragettes, aren't they? And Keir yeah. Hardy, and 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 they're, they're progressive political slogans on tea towels 
I've made that sound far less. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> that's than they are. that's a good summary. But they're very well designed, aren't they? They're, mugs, yeah. fridge magnets, a whole, whole variety of kind of politically themed gifts. That's yeah. what we like to say. I kind of feel it's a sign of our age in that we both had Che Guevara t-shirts ten years ago, and now what we really want is a tea towel. Is yes. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about when you decided when you settled on North Korea for this year's trip. What was the what was the and it start? And then I imagine you know. I don't know you tell the story, but I imagine there's the idea and then there's a bit of time where you actually convince yourself, no, this is what I'm gonna, where I'm going to go. My, I, my cousin had been living in China for four years teaching English and I like the idea of just dropping in on him and going to see him because it's always better when you visit any country if you can meet somebody either who's a local or who's been living there for a while because they just know the best places to go, the experiences to have and what's a waste of time and not and everything else. And uh, so my plan was I, I, I would go to China and see him and I wanted to, to stretch myself a bit further and I'd read about somebody uh, online talking about an experience visiting North Korea uh, as part of his, his experience visiting every country on the planet and that, that popped the idea in my mind that maybe it was time for me to try something like that and so I started doing my research and found a number of different companies online that were, were offering North Korean trips and I thought... Uh, you know, I read the reviews and it sounded like an experience not to be missed, really. Because I think the, the important thing about this story is, I imagine folk listening to this will think, he must be mental, and anyone who goes and does this, but you're not, like, I've known you for a long time, and you're not bonkers, and you're, you're, like a, <laughs> you're a normal person who does normal things by and large, and yet this is a totally extraordinary well, I... way to spend <laughs> your summer holiday. Right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's not exactly a beach holiday, you know, it's, it's, and it's not a relaxing holiday, you know, if, if, if that's the kind of thing you want, you yeah. know, you, there are lots of great places in Europe that I can recommend. No, I, I, I kind of, I, I'm at the stage where, you know, I, I want to be, I want to be intellectually challenged a bit, you know, when, when, that sounds really poncy, but uh, I want to, I want to come away with something different, something u- unique, something that challenges me. Uh, something that's that's memorable and you know i've been to spain many times in my life yeah. you know you you, you want you want to mix it up a bit but i i think you know that said you, you've been nice to me saying that that i'm not crazy because no, yeah, I think you, you have to be a bit crazy to go <laughs> north, north korea i think maybe but I, th- I just think it's an important point actually that it's not it's not totally beyond anyone's capacity no. or you know re- remit or imagination to go and if anything i'm the crazy one because when i heard you were going i was amazed and wanted to know every detail and, and still do and have, have, have been fascinated in it a long time and geeked out on all of the documentaries online and everything like that and, and, and yeah probably have an unhealthy interest in it compared to some people who go but, so tell me how how you so you've decided you want to go you go online you look at a few companies and there's companies who do this commercially and take people into north how does that yes. how does that work and how do you start engaging with them yes there are a number of companies online that offer trips to north korea uh, but this is an interesting point in itself because it's a bit like in the supermarket you'll be presented with multiple different types of the same product and there's a certain amount of skill in figuring out what the actual differences are other than the packaging in these things because when it comes to North Korea all of the trips to the country my understanding is are run by a government run and government owned tour agency uh, who decide the itineraries and make all the bookings and plans and hotels and everything. And so what the on the companies you find online are is kind of front companies, if you like, for that, uh, that state-owned company. And they are independent entities, uh, often run by Western entrepreneurs living in China or, or in other parts of the world as well. There's, there's a, uh, one based in the UK, there's one in the US and Canada and everything. But essentially... Uh, yes, yes, I can't remember what it's called, uh, but there is there is a US-based one taking over US uh, tourists as well. Um, but, I mean, all of these are, you, you know, that's so that when you email people, you're dealing with people in your own native language uh, who are, will process your documents for you and everything else. Once you get in the country, the experience you have is essentially the same regardless of which company you choose. That that's what That's what my research has led me to believe, and I haven't heard or read anything since then to, to disprove that so just just give us an idea of how i mean how much does it cost to go on holiday to north korea so the, the pound is very weak at the moment and and declined halfway through this year uh, which 
you know, made it more expensive than it would otherwise have been. So imagine if you're not living in the UK, it's probably one of the best times to go to North Korea. Uh, it it cost me uh, for a week. Uh, it cost a, a six night tour in North Korea. All travel to and from Beijing included on the train uh, cost one thousand one hundred thereabouts. Pounds. That's British pounds. Yes. Yeah. You, the first decision that you made, which I thought was a really interesting and worthwhile one, was uh, you took the train into North Korea, and you can either fly in, I believe, on our good friend Rupert Reid, who is trained to be a pilot and knows everything about airlines, is horrified by Air Cairo, or whatever they're called, who have the world of the worst safety records and fly over Russian jets. So you wisely avoided that and took the train up through the north of China and, and down. But that must have been fascinating because you get to see, you get to see all of the country as well. What was it like at that moment when you are waiting, I imagine, on the north side of the bridge over the, the, the Tumen River or the... Yes, so the train stops in... I took the train in and the train stops in Dandong, which is a Chinese city that no one's ever heard of, but it's one of these places with almost a million people living there. So, you know, it's the size of Birmingham and uh, it's... We, the, we, the train stopped there and we were told right you've got two hours to go or an hour to go out and find a bathroom somewhere you know pick up some food oh and by the way if you go to the river you'll catch a glimpse of North Korea looking over so we all did that and you know as if in a in a, in a horror film or something you, you look over and you see this uh, the other side of the river shrouded in mist and these kind of uh, you know, not much development over the other side, should we say? I mean, Dandong is one is a developed Chinese city. And there's high rises everywhere, and new construction happening, and blocks of apartments. And there's actually a there's a bridge that juts out about half, but right to the middle point of the river, with a viewing platform at the end that's full of Chinese tourists going over to peer over Looking into, into the Korea. Hermit Kingdom to see what they can they can see. Oh, wow. Uh, but is it, it stops visibly abruptly. different? From, do, you, do you get a sense of this is visibly a different nation from the one that we're stood in? I mean, even even looking over from Dandong, yes, it felt like that. Just because, like I say, you couldn't you couldn't see any buildings. I mean, you might have expected something. I, I think I struggle to think of any developed area in the world where you don't have you you, you can't stand at one side of the river and be in a very, uh, you know in a, in a city essentially, and then look over to the other side and feel like it's countryside. Um, and that, that's essentially what it felt like. I'm almost surprised that there's no propaganda value in, in putting something there. Did I, I've, I've seen yeah. pictures of that bridge that you went over on, on the train, which is literally lit at night halfway across. Yes. And the lights go out because that's the border. Yes. Well, actually, yes, the, the pro- it depends who is putting the propaganda on there for, for whom, right? The, you know, c- coming back on the train, leaving North Korea... You, the train, uh, the track kind of curves round, so you get Dandong on your left side for a big part of the trip, and you really you're going through all these North Korean fields, and and Dandong looks like this, you know, you see all the high rises, this this modern metropolis sticking out over the river, and that must be visible for miles and miles around to your average North Korean who can, you know, being nowhere close to Pyongyang will never have seen anything like it and how, how the charade is maintained that China is this poor nation mm. uh, I, I, I don't understand it mm. but yes there's an, imme- there's an immediate difference there's an immediate cut off and actually nowhere was that more uh, conscious to us than when we were crossing over the bridge the, tra- the train ekes across that bridge and as soon as you're above North Korean land, North Korean territory, the first thing that comes into view for you is an abandoned fairground with an, an old Ferris wheel and, uh, and you know, everything's rusted and nobody there. And it's exactly like those, I don't know if you've seen those pictures online of uh, Chernobyl, you know, showing this abandoned city, but it just, it just looks like that initially. That's the first impression of North Korea. So it completely matches the stereotype. <laughs> it lives up to expectations in that sense. And then before you know it, you're stopping at a station and you're there for the next, we were there for about two hours, I think, while we get our passports checked and our bags checked and, uh, and everything else. And what, what, what does that look like? What does, you know, getting your passports checked? And is it, are they welcoming? Is it abrupt? Is it how does you know these are military people who are doing this to you? Yes, uh, there are a lot of soldiers uh, on the train platform, all standing there to attention, and 
you know you can get off the train and stand on the platform. You can even drink beer on the platform. Uh, there's somebody came past with a trolley selling us beer, but you're certainly not leaving that station or go or going far from there. Yeah, there's, there's no, nobody turns up and says, "Hey, welcome to North Korea, guys." Um, <laughs> that's for sure. The 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 um, military type personnel. I say military type. I think they're an extension of the army, but presumably a customs division of it or something. They they turn up on the train. Uh, they all your passports are taken off to be processed for an hour, and um, and then they'll come back on the train and start searching your your bags and wanting to see your phones and your cameras and that type of thing. And what they're looking for. It, we were warned beforehand by, by our Western guide who was with us from the, the tour company. Uh, what they're looking for is, uh, first of all, pornography, uh, anything that might be deemed indecent images. You're not allowed to take that into North Korea. Uh, they're looking for any books about or articles or media about North Korea. Uh, you're not allowed to take any of that in either. And they were also... Didn't you get in slight trouble with a book? Ah yes, well, <laughs> uh, yes, well, I was I was asked by uh, one of these these guards. Uh, they, they they came to our kind of cabin on the train, and they he just said book book, and um, people would 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 show him various books that they had or something. And he looked at me and he said book, and then I said no book, and then he decided to search my large case and he went through it and he found a guidebook to Shanghai and so he picked it up and waved it in the air for everyone to see saying book book and then everybody immediately starts going in their cases and taking out their guides to China and uh, all the other places they've been travelling in the world none of us were stupid enough to have taken a guidebook to North Korea into the country so we were okay on that front but uh, but they were they they were they were reasonably you know Oh, and, and certainly they, they were on the hunt for some specific things. Who else is on this train with you? So there's your tour, tour group of, of which there's, what, 20-odd 20 20 odd people on the train, I guess? Yes. Who else is on this train? The, the train was actually was pretty full, actually. Uh, there were some Chinese tourists on there, for sure. Uh, but I think the rest of the people on the train were North Koreans who were coming back from business trips to China. And I know this because... Uh, in the queue for leaving Chinese, cu- departing Chinese customs, um, we, I spoke to uh, some North Koreans who were standing in the queue behind us, and we, we swapped passports and looked at each other's passports, a couple of young lads. And, uh, these and they, are young North Koreans? Right? These are young North Koreans, yes. How and, old are we talking? Uh, they, were, they were, I would say, mid, no, no, late 20s, late 20s. Uh, well, there were two. The two lads were in their late twenties, but they seemed to have some kind of minder woman with them, who stood there completely expressionless, but you know, watching over us and, and every interaction. And she was probably in her forties, I think. I mean, I, I was hard to get much out of them. And and a general theme for speaking to North Koreans in general is, I, I think the fact most of them don't speak English uh, is, is is a reality, and the English is limited. But you're never quite sure whether that's just being used as an excuse not to reply to a certain question. Because you know, a lot of North Koreans do have good English, and, uh, and it, but it seems to fail them at certain key moments. <laughs> and, uh, and I wasn't sure, but uh, you know, I was happy to just have a conversation with these guys and ask them as many questions as I thought suitable. And I gather that they've been in China for some kind of business, um, which I think is, is something that is tacitly allowed by the regime, uh, by certain pre-approved people. And they had certainly, if they're going in via the official route like this, they they weren't they weren't going out without permission. That's for sure. And they, <clears throat> the guy showed me his passport, and he must have had about fifteen stamps there, going backwards and forwards between China and North Korea. So clearly, this was something that he did on a regular basis. Mm. And so you, you your train pulls out, and you then take the train down through. For anyone who doesn't know the geography, nearly all of North Korea, really, because Pyongyang is only eighty miles north of the DMZ that's or something right, yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and it seems to me strange that you, you you go on a tour which is highly, well, I mean we'll get into it, but it's highly regimented, you only see things that you're supposed to see, you're told not to photograph certain things in the middle of the showcase capital which they don't think is appropriate, and yet you're allowed to come in on a train in daylight hours you said, uh, through through the entire country, I mean what was that like, did you feel it gave you an insight into things that you weren't supposed to see or wouldn't have seen otherwise? Or Yes, so we, we took this train through. North Korea to go to Pyongyang through the countryside in the middle of the day and I'd been told beforehand and warned by plenty of people in the UK oh you won't get to see any of the poverty in North Korea it'll all be hidden from you you won't get to see any real life 
and uh, and you'll have a totally artificial experience. And yet, absolutely, the first thing that, that was drawn to my attention was the, the countryside and the poverty that you see in the countryside uh, going through. And there's, there's, you, you can't, you might be able to, you know, prettify certain areas of the capital city or the hotels that you stay in, but you can't change an entire nation overnight, uh, not unless it's real. And going through the countryside, you know, you see a distinct absence of any machinery, even though you're traveling through farmlands almost the entire time. There are no modern combine harvesters or tractors or anything like that. Uh, you, you, you know, you were seeing bales of hay everywhere. Um, and I, th- I think also rice growing areas that had been harvested, I think was a lot of what we were seeing. But you see people kind of, you know, bending over in, in, in rivers, washing, cl- I saw people washing clothes in, in, in rivers and um, uh, people walking around, lots of people cycling around. Uh, and what I didn't see until we were pretty close to Pyongyang was any cars whatsoever. We travelled for a couple of hours before we saw any cars. What was the housing like? Yeah, it was. Some of it was two story, but it was mostly single story concrete uh, houses. Uh, you know, it looked f- like fairly sturdy stuff, uh, but you know, they, they, they did. It didn't look like that. You know, you didn't see kind of modern villages and towns and things and. Uh, uh, certainly, the roads that we, the few roads that we did see, looked very poor quality. Uh, I mean, it looked, you know, for anyone who's travelled through the third world, it felt like we were going through a third world country, essentially. And then, and then you get to Pyongyang, you arrive at the central station. Now, central stations in any city are always interesting, and they're often pretty grotty. And like the, if you think of King's Cross, or have you ever been to the, the station in Naples? Oh no, my God! No. It's like the end of the earth. Like it's, you know, it's where all the, all the, all the evil fun things go to play. Uh, and in the, some of the stuff that I've read about North Korea, at least, it's it, during the height of the famine. It was a it was a real focal point for people as well. What was it like pulling into the terminus in Pyongyang? Well, we were glad to finally arrive and finally have this uh, this long journey behind us. Although actually, travelling on the train had been quite fun. We'd we'd had some North Korean food and drank lots of North Korean beer, which was nice. But we'll talk about that later. Uh, it was it. Was, we we got out of the platform and the first thing that struck me was how dark everything was. There were lights, but they were clearly on some dim setting or or the bulbs were really bad or something. But there was just you know there was clearly they were clearly having power problems. In fact, the whole as we'd have pulled into Pyongyang uh, and going through the city, we'd noticed that it had been getting very dark and that the street lamps you know weren't always on and that kind of thing. So so that was the first thing that struck me. But it was an it was a you know kind of you know high ceilinged reasonably grand looking station old you know it wasn't like the the very modern ones that i'd seen throughout china which were built to, for capacity of many thousands this was clearly a station designed to take people in and out of uh, in and out of pyongyang and there weren't many people traveling in mm. and out of pyongyang that's the impression i had anyway and were people amazed to see you who weren't in that train and in that area <coughs> or really or were people amazed to see us or surprised to see us? I, I, I got the imp- in the station. I got the impression that they were they're fairly used to having tour groups arrive and pass through quickly. We were ushered out through a side entrance, uh, which I thought was interesting because presumably we weren't meant to interact with locals in the into the, the 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 main hall, the central area. And as soon as we were in the car park, we were ushered onto a coach. Uh, there were a few people milling about in that car park, but. You know, no one that we kind of we kind of saw. And this was a funny thing about North Korea, actually, is how I mean people do. If if you go you go in China beforehand, and in China, even in the big cities, people will stop and want to take their photo with you. And you know, I was asked to uh, in in Hangzhou, I was asked to hold somebody's baby and have my photograph taken with them. And and people will be sneakily checking you out and secretly photographing you and stuff. And it's because you know, for a lot of people in China, they've not seen any tourists, and 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 maybe they're maybe they're internal Chinese tourists from one city to another, and in their their city further inland, they don't see many tourists. So there's this fascination with with people of different races and, and cultures you know as it would be for me if i didn't live in london no doubt but the strange thing was that in north korea you, tourists were even rarer and so people were even less likely to have seen a tourist and yet there was generally not much interest in us at all people not weren't much looking at us. Or, or too scared 
Well, absolutely, and and that's the that's the kind of the assumption that you make that people don't want to get involved. Uh, because stopping on the street to have a chat with a stranger is generally something, well, certainly a, a, a Western tourist is something that doesn't look like it takes place. But it, the question is, what are they afraid of? Because uh, are, are locals afraid of the consequences of doing something like that? Because they're afraid of getting in trouble, that it would be disapproved of by the government? Or are they, af- are they genuinely afraid? Because supposedly a lot of the indoctrination that they've grown up with has taught them that mm. we might be Americans who are going to attack yeah. them with bayonets and uh, kill their children and, yeah. and things. You know, if you look at some of the, the racist propaganda that people grow up with over there, that's the message that's being put across. I don't want to skip ahead too far, but this is <coughs> a very pertinent point though for you to, to tell the story that you were telling me earlier about when you got into a taxi, hmm. potentially. Because, I mean... It's easy to it's easy to conceive that people aren't scared and perhaps they're disinterested, but that would that would imply otherwise, wouldn't it? Perhaps you could just tell that one quickly. So, after a few days in North Korea, I, I and and with these government guides following you around and everything, uh, part of me just wanted to see where the boundaries lay a little bit in terms of what we could do, and I wasn't going to do anything illegal or problematic or anything, but but I just. I was getting a bit frustrated with the fact that you'd come out of the toilet and they'd be waiting for you there and everything else. And I actually had a bit of rapport with our guides and I said to one of them, you know, what, what would happen if I, if we were standing outside a restaurant about to get on the coach and, and I said to one of the guides in my group, what would happen if I opened the door and sat in that taxi there? And she said, oh, we'd, you'd go home or something, ha ha ha. Or, or, you know, we'd, or we'd take you out and go back to the hotel or something like that, she joked. And I thought, oh, okay, well, that sounds reasonable. That doesn't sound too bad. It doesn't sound like like death by firing squad. So, so I went and opened the door for this taxi and sat in the front seat and turned to the driver and said hello. And this man looked at me and he didn't say anything. He His eyes widened and his face went white. He, he looked to me to be in great fear. And he immediately opened the door, stood outside the taxi and, and kind of waved his hands in the air. And what I think he was saying was, look, here's proof I'm not going to drive away. He was showing somebody that he wasn't going to drive away, presumably our guides, who then came to my door and opened it and beckoned me out of the cab. And and I complied. I came out of the cab and, and then that was it. There was no telling off. There was no discussion. There was no, Luke, why did you do that? Or anything like that. We just got on the coach and it was as if it never happened. And that was it. And what presumably, well, seemed like a major event in the life of this taxi driver was just considered to be a did complete he, non-event. Did you see anyone, did anyone say anything to him or anything? No, and, and, and they wouldn't have because it was clear to everyone that I had just acted totally out of, out of anybody's control. I'd done something that's totally normal in any other country in the world, third world, first world, wherever. There is nowhere in the world where you can't go up to a taxi, open the door, sit in, and, and, and asked to be taken where you want to go. Uh, maybe they were, I don't know, I haven't found them yet. Mm. But in North Korea, that, <laughs> that is a unique event and it's something that certainly as a tourist you're not allowed to do and in the life of a local is something that doesn't happen, it seems. I love the idea that somewhere in Pyongyang that night in some, you know, a 19th story of some god-awful apartment block, yeah. some guy came over and said to his wife, you will never believe what happened to me today. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <that>? yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and I quite like that idea as well. And uh, yes. So you get to your hotel. I think, uh, tell me a bit first about the hotel, because this hotel is, is deliberately on an island, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yes, the hotel is on an island in the middle of the river Tumen that goes through Pyongyang. And that means that there's only, there's only one way off the island, or, or two ways off, which are bridges at either end. And I, 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 that, I think, makes it a bit more convenient for them to make sure that, that you're not going wandering off into the, into the city. But actually, you can't even get out of the hotel car park because there are minders standing at the entrance to the hotel who won't let you go beyond, well, even halfway through the car park. They weren't letting you go any further than that. Uh, which is a shame because there was an abandoned stadium on the island, which I would have loved to go and see. Uh, some kind of game stadium that, was, that looked to be in disrepair. And what was it like? Because I imagine that they're, they're on the one hand trying very hard to prove that they're, you know, um, advanced and will have internet and all the kind of modern things. And yet I can't help but imagine that it's, you know, that feeling when something's a near miss. Like I went away for a weekend recently on a, 
on a, I won't name and shame the place, but I went on a Woucher thing. And it was one of those ones where it was nice and it was fine, but it just needed a lick of paint and the mm. whole thing was kind of... I kind of get that in, in, impression with it that it's... Um, yeah, it's trying, to, it's trying to show the world that it's high-tech and yet were there bits that fell short as far as you were concerned? Yeah, so the, the hotel was... You stand outside, it, it looks... It's, uh, I think, 60 stories or something, 60 or 50 stories, and it's got this revolving restaurant at the top and, and it's the kind of place that you would imagine that in the 50s or 60s would have been the height of modernity. It was like something out of James Bond or something, something really luxurious, but has never been updated since then. And so you, you go into the lobby and it's, there's high ceilings and marble everywhere and, and the place does look very grand. Um, and, you know, they, it's a nice enough place. You know, you're not going to... Uh, it didn't feel like... It didn't feel extremely shabby or anything. It felt like, it felt like you know, some, something... It felt like a reasonably luxurious place, as I say, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, you know, the, but there are little things, you know, as soon as you scratch below the surface, you start to see how old it is or how it, it doesn't quite conform to the image of uh, modernity that the regime necessarily want to put across. Because, Such as? well, the lighting, for example, it's, it's you know, you've got this kind of, the, the light bulbs are clearly very old. They're not the the LED, you know, efficient ones and, and you know, giving you bright daylight that you would expect in any hotel in in most hotel, nice hotels in China or in, in uh, the US or the UK or wherever. Um, the, the lifts move very slowly. Um, there's to just the, the decor, the, the carpets look very old and, you know, the wallpaper in the rooms and the... Um, did you um, go up to the restaurant at the time? I did go up to the, the restaurant, oh, the revolving does, it restaurant. Does revolve it, it does, does revolve very slowly, <laughs> yes. Yes, we were the only people in there, yes. Uh -huh. What was the food like? The food, the food throughout North Korea was was pretty basic. I think they 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 were making a big effort for us, but it was, I think there were certain, there were you know don't forget luxury ingredients or luxury goods are are, are not allowed to be imported in North Korea, so they have to be pretty self sufficient, and they can get some basics in from China, I think, but sanctions prevent them having, having really nice stuff. In the in the lift in the hotel, there were funny little videos with f funky lift music which show people cooking and try to give this impression that you can taste all four corners of the earth in the local restaurants and they're full of happy North Korean chefs cooking away, making what look like gourmet meals. Um, you, we, did, you know, we weren't close to starving in the hotel, to put it that way, but it was, it was fairly basic stuff. You know, we, it, breakfast would be, um, you know, you could get cucumbers and tomatoes and bits of onion and things like that. And they had some pancakes there, which you could, you know, spread some jam on. And they would make you, there was a chef there who would make you omelette uh, or scrambled egg or something like that for you. Um, and they had some, what seemed to be some kind of deep fried chicken that you could have as well. And um, maybe some bits of fish as well. But um, but it was it was kind of pretty, fla pretty plain, pretty basic. Um, it was very different to what I had at some places in China. You know, in a nice hotel in China or something that claimed to be as grand, you would get a really, really nice breakfast, a really, really nice meal there. And and this this wasn't that, but this was about as good as it got, I would say, in North Korea. You told me that one night you you ducked out into the stairwell, and despite being on the untinted floor, there was only kind of three or so floors with people in it. Yes, I was on the thirty ninth floor, I think, and. Uh, I, that somebody had left the door open for the emergency exit, so I had a quick look in there and looked up, and it was just black blackness. Uh, completely, all the floors were unlit, and then about five of the floors below me were lit up, but beyond that, it was completely black. Until you know, if you got the right angle, you could just about see the ground floor uh, lights all the way down there. But it seemed that the the hotel was largely empty, which would make sense because when we were in the hotel bar, when we were playing pool, um, when we were playing table tennis in the basement, all that kind of stuff. We did see other people, but, you know, very, very few other people, really. And, you know, at breakfast, there were, you know, I, I, there can't have been more than 100 people in that hotel, put it that way. You, know, you obviously, obviously, you're thinking about this change as the time <laughs> went on there, but just, you know, sticking your head out the fire exit when you know you're not really supposed to, you just feel terrified <coughs> doing things like that, or... <laughs> No, I, I, 
it's funny thinking about it beforehand it's not the kind of thing I would have done um, even though it sounds really normal for us because of our idea of the idea in our mind that we have of North Korea is that everywhere you go Kim Jong-un's there with his finger on the red button ready to nuke Seoul or something and or, or, or lock you up and actually you know when you're there it, it's the usual thing in life that more than anything else most people are, are, are kind of bored with you they're not interested they're busy getting on with their own life and things are pretty chaotic and disorganized and you know it, it's it's the same in any part of the world that you go to it's easy not to be noticed um, as long as you're not causing trouble for anyone so you know, this this door was open. I just had a quick look into the emergency exit up and down. You know, it was something I felt I could justify if anybody stopped me. Uh, I, I certainly, I wasn't walking up and down the emergency exit stairs, so nobody would be able to make that accusation. I was just being curious, really. And yet there is a line, though, because this is the same hotel that this chap, who, Canadian chap, German chap? Uh, he was American. American. Yeah. Which might have had something to do with it, presumably, but stole a... Banner was it? It was a it was a some sort of poster that was on the wall in the hotel basement, I believe. That's right. Yes, an American student named Otto. Uh, he was, I think, nineteen years old when this happened, nineteen or twenty one, and he went to a part of the hotel that he wasn't supposed to, a staff only area, and stole a banner of some kind that related to the Workers' Party. That's my understanding, anyway. And this was a story that was verified to me by the the Western tour guides that uh, were from the the the, the, the tour company. It was the same tour company in the same hotel. It was the same tour company, yes, yes. And uh, so that had happened uh, at the, the hotel. Yes. So I imagine what happens in those situations is, if you take your taxi story as an example, it, the people who discover that probably think, oh. God, first and foremost, like, do I have to deal with this or not? Would be my would be my kind of feeling if I was a minder. Because if we're going to make a big deal out of this, it's going to be a massive thing, and I'm going to have to do all this work and I have to justify it to the people above me. And 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 in the case of Otto, I imagine he's now, I mean, he's now a pawn in the international relations yeah. game, isn't he? Because he pushed it kind of too far. Whereas with your one, I imagine they just thought, oh God, do you know what? We can't be bothered with the hassle that. A minor occurrence <coughs> like this will. will I, I, that's kind of my read of it from the outside. I don't. I don't know what you think. Or yes. Yeah. So I, I was willing to push the boundaries to find out more to pursue my curiosity, and and and. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a bit reckless or something. But certainly, you know, I, I you know, what I did was relatively minor stuff, and I, I'm not, I'm saying you know most people I think on the group were willing to conform a lot more and we're going to keep their heads down and, and shut up but for me that's not part of the experience you know for, for for me I want to be able to think I want to be able to ask questions and do stuff and 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 I, I tried to find out where the boundaries would be beforehand by speaking to the tour company and actually I was told look it's very hard to get arrested here actually there were there were things that are crimes in North Korea which would not be any kind of a crime in, in the US or the UK um, but you just need to be, you know, aware of what those things might be. Um, other than that, you know, and, and that, you know, but things like, you know, things like stealing a, a, a banner, um, and anything to do with the party, anything that insults the workers' party in some way, or more importantly, insults the leadership in any way, or, or tries to be rude towards them, or you know, defaces anything. Because there was a moment, wasn't there, where one of your tour folk and we'll get onto them in a second who they were and what they were like but she I believe yeah. she remarked foolishly why is Kim Jong-un so fat when his people are so hungry yes so there was a lady in the tour group uh, from the UK who and I didn't hear this I hasten to add this was retold to me by someone else in the group but she apparently uh, said at that, that less than a whispering voice in front of one of the statues of the leaders Oh, you know, he's the the the, the leader Kim Il Sung or, or Kim Jong Jong Il. Uh, they they seem to be so overweight, or they seem to be pretty well fed, but their people seem so thin. And she'd said she'd remark she'd said this, and one of the guides in our group had apparently overheard this, and had said to one of the uh, one of the guys in our group, uh, he said, you know, he'd said. Did she say that he was fat? And thankfully, the, the 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 guy in our group that he was speaking to said, "Oh no, I think she said something else." Or you know, 
was misheard or something. And so nothing happened to her. But it was a very silly thing to say. And I didn't say anything like that. <laughs> but again, I think that's an example <coughs> of perhaps everybody choosing for the sake of, you know, as a, as a mind that you can either go to the wall about that, can't you? And say, yes, you did yeah. say that. Or you can just pretend that it's all fine. And, and I just find that interesting because I, yeah. I can see... Because I think what's starting to emerge here, and I think we'll look at later on when we talk about your mind, is, is a picture of people who, you know, of course, have a day job to do effectively there. And, mm. and, and perhaps aren't ideologues in the sense that they'll, you know, die in a ditch over every comment and, and pick you up on every single thing and have wider considerations about them. Yes, the guides I thought were really interesting. I mean, people say you can't speak to real North Koreans when you go to North Korea. That's not true because you can speak to the guides. And they are a, a small subset of North Korean society, of course, a very privileged subset of North Korean society, but they are fascinating insights nonetheless. And my impression from speaking to the guides in general was that, you know, yeah, they were, they were people just trying to do a job. Um, they, they, they were pretty friendly people. I think they were genuinely loyal to the leadership. You know, they, they had genuine admiration and loyalty towards their leadership, Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il. And, and one of the reasons that you shouldn't say anything insulting to the leadership is because it was something that was going to immediately upset them. Whether they believe all the propaganda about how great their country is and how they have nothing to envy in the world and how well developed the country is and how the rest of the world is poor and oppressive and the United States are evil is another matter. Uh, and so there are, there are different strands to, 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 to the guides thinking there. I don't think... My impression was that they hadn't swallowed every bit of propaganda. They, they, they couldn't have done it. Tell me a bit about the group, just because there were some interesting people, weren't there? there was, so there was a guy who was South Korean who lived in Canada, and then there was an Israeli guy, and then just give people an idea of some of the, some yeah. of the folk. Yeah, I have to be careful not to um, yes, give too much away to yeah. identify anyone. But, um, yeah, there was, it was a mixed group, a uh, mixed international group. There were people from the US. There were, uh, I think, four or five of us in total from the UK. I, I didn't know that American citizens were allowed here. Americans can go in. They have to fly in. They're not allowed to take the train. They have to get the plane. One of those many strange rules that are just totally ex unexplained to you and you've no idea why they exist. There were Canadians. There were, uh, there were several guys from Australia. I think there were five people from Australia. And, uh, and then a lot of Europeans as well. A Frenchman, uh, a guy from Serbia, one from Portugal. So it's a pretty international group. And did you, I mean, I was incredibly inc brave going by yourself, I thought, because you kind of, kind of feel, well, if there was two of you, then, you know, you'd have someone to kind of fight your corner a bit if if you had been misinterpreted saying one of the statues was fat or something. Do you know what I mean? You would have had someone who'd slightly, did you build a rapport with others in the group or did you feel like they'd have your back if something happened? Or Because I imagine it very quickly becomes every man for himself if if something goes wrong. Yeah, I mean, these are strangers, but you. This is one of the advantages of taking the train in is you can you know have a few beers with these people and you know you'll find out about each other's lives and you're all equally excited and and actually you're going through this very emotional experience, aren't you? And uh, this very vibrant experience together, and I think that actually uh, helps facilitate friendship in many ways. So yeah, you know, I felt like you know these were people I could get on with, and I've kept in touch with people you know on Facebook and that kind of thing after the trip. Uh, so so yeah, I felt like I was with a good bunch. Mm. So very quickly, because I imagine anyone <laughs> listening to certainly this, this <laughs> gone through it this far and listening at this point, fairly familiar with the tour itinerary because it's a fairly standard kind of thing. Um, so good, perhaps could just give us a quick whip through what that looked like and what you went to see, and then we'll get onto some of the stories of, of, of that you did. Yeah, sure. So itinerary that we spent the first day going around Pyongyang. We were taken to the uh, the, the, the statue, the monument to the Juche ideal, which is that kind of neo-Marxist philosophy out there, which, which it's is, about self-reliance and yes, well, it's it's one of these non-philosophies, a bit like Ayn Rand. Uh, and, and you, you know, actual philosophers would never agree to it being a philosophy. It's not something you'd ever study in university, for example, uh, much as they'd like to portray it as that kind of thing. Um, we went to we went to the central library. Uh, and uh, the central square and that kind of thing, and uh, so that was kind of the first date. You asked for a copy of George Orwell, I believe, in the library. I, 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 I on the search engine in the central library, I, we, we were told we could search for any book in the world, you know, any book that we wanted, 
and uh, so I got the I got the guides to put the English language function on. I typed in Animal Farm, and I got a whole load of books about farm animal management. <laughs> certainly, nothing by George Orwell. No entries from nineteen eighty four either. And uh, I think I put in I put, I typed in the UK as well, and there were books about jewelry in the United Ki- jewelry making in the United Kingdom. And then I also, but I also typed in because I thought, oh, maybe they just don't have many English language books or something. Uh, or, 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 or translations or, or books that any of us would have heard of. But I, ty- I did type in Das Kapital by Marx, and they had that, mm. many copies of Das Kapital, so it was okay. But we were told behind a white wall that there were a million books in storage that, that people could access, except we couldn't access them. You need, to, you need to know what you're looking for first, request a book, and then they go out the back and get it for you. Mm. But you never actually get to see these supposed million books that exist in the Central Library. <laughs> and you tried to speak to someone in the English language section? Uh, that was actually in the science. Uh, uh, I wanted to say science museum. It's called the National Science and Technology Centre, and it's presented as a kind of science academy. and And they and it looks, or well, they want it to look like a cross between a a university science lab and a science museum for children, and a library where people go to surf the internet or do research. And some kind of lab as well for scientists. They want it to look. It, they they kind of got elements of all of these things within there, except it feels like a bit of a charade because the students there don't seem to be doing any studying. I mean, we, we'd walk past these lines of computers, and and they were, the the the, the, the kids essentially. They were watching boxing videos and anime cartoons and things, and and, and quickly minimizing their browsers as we walked past. It's nice uh, that that's a universal, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, 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 ab- absolutely. I recognised it straight away, I've got to say. Um, so, so you, you, you know, the kid's doing that. The science kind of machine, the science museum elements of it were kind of, kind of simple little science experiments that you might show to children. I mean, it was hard to see how, how, how this was necessarily, uh, you know, a great monument to North Korean science, put it that way. They don't have access to the internet there. It's actually only the intranet, which supposedly is 29 websites that are approved by the North Korean government. It's all internal stuff. And um, the, the most, you know, the, the part where people seem to be most active in the museum was the kids section at the end, which was full of games, and uh, where we found a seven-year-old playing a, a game uh, that involved um, uh, throwing missiles at U.S. warships. Now, you know, I remember some people in our group remarked at the time, oh, well, it's just like uh, Call of Duty, right? You know, we've got video games here where you blow up all kinds of people and, you know, the fact that kids can access video games is not a thing. Well, yes, uh, we, we, you do have free access to that kind of thing in the West, but... I've never seen anything like that in a state-built science museum. You know, I've never seen I've never seen violent video games pushed by yeah. the government as yeah. such uh, it, it, in, into kids into kids' hands. There's a clear distinction there. Uh, and then, then so you do all the stuff that everybody does. I dream you go to the main square, which you see, um, and you go on the subway, which is phenomenal. And I mean, that's a podcast in itself. The yes, subway yes, and, it and is. <laughs> But what, I mean, the two that I really want to focus on within the itinerary, the first is the demilitarized zone, the DMZ as it's called, because, I mean, Bill Clinton described that as the scariest place in the world. Is that a fair, <laughs> a fair anal- analysis of it? Or? No, I, I, I don't think, it didn't feel that scary to me somehow, maybe because, you know, it was full of tourists. There were lots of other tour groups arriving on the same day. You know, there's a group from Hong Kong and, and kind of everyone we kept bumping into at other points in Pyongyang seemed to congregate at the DMZ. It was clearly the day that everybody gets to go to the DMZ. And uh, and everything, you know, seemed pretty routine there. They didn't see thousands and soldiers standing there ready to fire a bullet at people immediately. The place was very, very quiet and not really much going on there. And did you get to go in the hut which straddles the border and... Yes, there were a series of huts, some of which are owned by the UN and South Korea and some of which are owned by North Korea, and they're, they're colour-coded to reflect that. And halfway through these huts is the, is the line. And so you can you go in. We, 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 um, we were told beforehand, if one of the South Korean huts is open, we'll go in. And this is apparently a perfectly allowed thing that they're, they're comfortable with. And, so, and fortunately, it was open, so we all went into this hut, crossed the line over to South Korea, the actual exit onto the South Korean side was guarded by a couple of North Korean soldiers, and um, 
and yeah, we weren't in there very long really, and then we were ushered outwards. But I was very pleased to go to the GMZ because it was the one place in North Korea where you get mobile signal. Yeah, it texted your mum, I remember, you telling me. <laughs> yes, she was delighted to receive that message, but I only found out once I'd left North Korea and was back in China, of course. But. I think it's a nice story. <laughs> it's, it seems so arbitrary. that So you say things like, well, you know, we'll turn up and if, and if one of the huts is open, we'll go in there. And yet other stuff, they will lose their shit about. You know, it, you know to me, that is more of a big deal than nicking a poster off a wall. Or, or you know, it just seems, the whole thing seems <laughs> totally arbitrary in many ways. And with no, I imagine no explanation was very often forthcoming as to what was important and why. Yeah, ab- yeah, absolutely. I mean, we were told we were told in the in the DMZ, you know, no photos of the military, and you know, it's an important place and everything. But there was no safety briefing beforehand. There was no, we didn't sign any disclaimers or anything. Apparently, this is what happens to you when you visit the South Korean. Well, side. I've heard that from the South side, it's a wholly different. That's right, and you can't. Apparently, on the South side, you can't take photographs as well. But on the North side, they had no problem with you taking photos. In fact, actually, the DMZ was the one place where we could photograph so- soldiers within the hut. Some of us got photographs of the soldiers in the hut, perfectly legitimate. You know, people were posing for selfies with them, and that was you couldn't do that anywhere outside of the TMZ. Ironically, you know, in other places, you know, somebody was photographed carrying a bale of hay in the countryside, and the guides got really angry about that and made people delete it off their cameras. So this, it was a bit this sounds like a ridiculous question, but it's not, and it's just a continuation really of your taxi feeling. Do you not think to yourself like? What would happen if I just did a rel- what is in reality a relatively innocuous thing of walk five yards over there, but like across the line? I mean, presumably, you know, if you tried to make a run for it into South Korea, they pull you, they try and pull you back, and then there'd be gunfire, and then there'd be, or, or wouldn't there be? Or I don't, you know. Possibly. I mean, that's yeah, that's definitely not a risk I would take. No. That's something I would <laughs> test out. I mean, but but partly because you, who knows, you might get shot by the South Korean side as much as the North Koreans. Yeah. <coughs> but actually I didn't see a huge number of soldiers around of either side mm-hmm. there weren't a huge number of people kind of pointing their bayonets against each uh-huh. other uh-huh. the North Korean soldiers some North Korean soldiers were doing a little drill and a little march around the area but it was it was relatively tame I mean maybe all the action is in another part of the border because the DMZ is a you know very very long very very large area isn't it you know, we were being taken to a specific part the part where the armistice was signed um and the part where there, there were these huts and where all the cooperation happens. But that part was rel- relatively controlled and silent. And then, the, I mean, the, the one which I just thought you were remarkably um, almost blasé about in your... I mean, you weren't, but how anyone does this, I do not know. The mausoleum to the to, the two, to Kim Il-sung and Kim mm. Jong-il, you know, what is that like, going to see the, the embalmed corpses... Of two of histories, without doubt, you know, ultimate tyrants. Yeah, I, th- um, I, th- I think this was the most bizarre part of the trip for me, actually. To see, I mean, I'd read about going to a mausoleum beforehand. I thought, wow, we're going to see embalmed bodies. But just the, the build-up to the whole thing, the solemn crowds outside, everybody dressed smartly, including so you had us. To, they told you, especially <coughs> that day, you had to dress particularly. Yes, they, they, essentially they just didn't want us in jeans and uh, or trainers. Um, so... You know, we just they just want to see that we we'd made an effort, and so you know I put on a jacket and um, I I look quite smart apparently <laughs> according to other people in the group but much smarter than them. <laughs> um, so, but it's it, yes, it's a very solemn place. It's you know silent. Everything is taken off you, including you know not just your mobile phone and your wallet and things, but the tissues in your pocket are taken off you. Um, my my pocket square was taken out until. And, 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 and the man the man at the checkpoint, he kind of dabbed the pocket square on his eyes or in his eye as if to indicate that I might need it for crying purposes. And I nodded and then he gave it back to me. And so, so I got him with my pocket square. I was quite pleased with that. But then you go on this long, you walk down this corridor with images of the leaders either side meeting foreign dignitaries and, you know, these sort of quotations from them and lessons that they've given to workers and that kind of thing. And then the next thing you know, you're on this travelator and it's this travelator to nowhere. You're on a travelator for a good 10 minutes just going up with nobody talking you know, or only in hushed whispers perhaps. There's music playing in the background and, and then you have to go through, um, through an air tunnel to depurify you. I mean, it's just, it's, it's bizarre. And then the next thing you know, you're in this red-lit room 
which is freezing cold because they do it to preserve the body and there's a glass case in the middle and, and Kim Il-sung's in there and there he is draped in the Korean Workers' Party flag and there's soldiers standing around with guns in case anybody does something and then you have to bow uh, on on his left side, his right side and behind his head not behind his... Uh, no, and behind in front of his feet not behind his head uh, that because that apparently would be uh, a grave insult to the dear leader the great leader, sorry and uh, and then you're out, and then you do the whole thing again for Kim Jong Il, just when you thought it was all over. <laughs> you do the whole thing again, and the medal rooms. I, I didn't mention that, but at the end of each le- leader, after seeing them, you walk into this medal room with all the tributes that they've received from foreign dignitaries. Uh, not not the gifts, but the um, honorary degrees and um, you know uh, leadership medals and that kind of thing. And, and it it just re- you know it's. It's a list of the world's tin pot dictators and bad guys basically awarding each other medals to legitimise themselves. And then there's a few, you know, there was actually, you know, a fair amount from from Spain and Portugal in the times that they were dictators, for example. And then suddenly they all stop after the 1970s because they, they transferred to democracy. And then... And, and, and then in the middle of all of it, and this is the thing, because I thought, I'm, I better not find anything from the UK in here. And, uh, and sure enough, there was nothing from the UK. And then in the middle of everything, I find a medal from Derby County Council. Nice. Derbyshire County Council, sorry, had, had given some kind of award of the city or award of the county to Kim il I have no wow. idea why. <laughs> <laughs> It's completely random. Yeah, we really have random. to look that one up and see. If we we do. I've, I've Googled it and I can't find anything. I need to email the county council and find out what it was. But there's a, clearly a story behind that. Yeah, or it might not be real. Who knows? I mean, that's the thing. You're never quite sure. I mean, some of these could be fakes, you know. And didn't at one point, because obviously, you know, I imagine if ever there's a point where you don't want to do something that's misinterpreted, it's yeah. stood in front of the, you know, the cremated body of one of their leaders and didn't all hell break loose when someone sneezed oh yeah well, the, the, guy ne- the guy next to me Portuguese guy next to me sneezed the loudest sneeze you could possibly give <laughs> oh, right in the middle of it oh, God. it was such a shock because the whole place had been silent apart from this you know patriotic music in the background and the soldier the soldier in the room gave him the dirtiest <laughs> look <laughs> oh, we got out of there as soon as we could after that <laughs> oh, goodness me. oh bloody hell <laughs> but other than that, I, I was very well behaved yeah, when we went to the mausoleum. That's for sure, because I recognised it was a very, it was a place of great importance to them, and you know, it's a very solemn place. And you got to go. You very kindly actually sat next to you, as you can see on my um, mm. bookshelf, which I keep all my favourite things in the world. I've now got a fifty-one note from North Korea that you very kindly brought me back, which you weren't supposed to do. I understand. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, again, this is a bizarre thing. So this is one of those ones where. You got the impression you're allowed to break this law. So I mean, if you look at it, so I've it when you, you kind of sent it to me, this has clearly never been in circulation, has it? I mean, it's a brand new, yeah. it's a brand new note. So they're they're selling you these basically because they know you're taking them away, but say you can't, or how how did that? I oh interesting. No, I think I did have some notes which were a little bit more run down looking than that. But we went to a mall. Uh, as, as they called it, we we call it a department store, I suppose, which had been built by the Chinese apparently, and, and we were told that was the one place where we could ha- deal in get some local some North Korean currency, and so we swapped Chinese yuan for North Korean won at a massively favourable exchange rate, and then went around uh, around essentially a small supermarket buying stuff. Uh, but we were told that was the only. But we had to spend it all there, and we wouldn't be. You know, if we tried to use it anywhere else, we wouldn't be able to, and we weren't allowed to take it out of the country either. And I think that is the official rule. You're not meant to do that. Um, but you know, a rumor went round that uh, that we could. Uh, you know, that it probably wouldn't be checked, and it would be a nice little souvenir to have. Anyway, I, I kept hold of a wad of it. In fact, I I, I had several wads, but stored in different areas of my suitcase, so at least I get out with some of it. Um, I had some in my jacket pocket and some in my uh, next to my passport, and yeah, I got away with it. They didn't. They didn't look. Yeah. How do you gauge though the severity? This is this is what kind of my question. So, so that's the kind of thing where you think, um, yeah, you know, rumor goes around, nobody will mind. You take a bit with you because obviously it's lovely souvenir. I was delighted when I got my one. 
But then you get stopped to the border and they go, what is this? And you find yourself in a gulag and you think, oh Christ, how did I, you know, how did I misinterpret that? So, I mean, obviously yeah. you didn't misinterpret that. I, I, I think before, this is the thing, before going to North Korea, the, the, your impression of w- what is dangerous to do and what is not, I think is a little bit different from when you're in the country. Certainly from my point of view, I don't know, there were some people in the group who did seem kind of on edge the whole time and were definitely not going to push any of the boundaries. But there were others of us who, you know, were just a bit more lax and recognised that we could get away with certain things. And Like I said, maybe I'm just reckless, I'm not sure, but there were, there were, there were, I just felt like it was that was going to be okay. And as long as I, I hid it well enough and, you know, didn't declare it. And, but don't forget, by that point, I'd already been searched going into the country. So I had some idea about how thorough they might do things. And in fact, the search going out was even less thorough than the one coming in. So... You know, and then I was fairly confident that that would be... And even if they did, I would have just put my hand up and said, well, I had no idea that that was there. Yeah. You know, by all means, you know, take it. I mean, if, if, you, if you read what people have been arrested for in North Korea over the last 10 years, it's, you know, being journalists, it's stealing stuff, you know, political banners or whatever else. Yeah. And I didn't get the impression that uh, any of it was to do with you know, the So state. we were discussing before we started recording that I'd like to go, potentially, I'd be very interested in it. I'm not a journalist doing this. Like, I wouldn't conceive of myself as a journalist. But you could then get that thrown back in your face. Say, well, this one time you did this podcast thing and it, you know... I, I just feel it's so it's one of those ones yeah. where you it's so subjective isn't it and it's so um, but it's interesting that you felt it was your perception of what was dangerous clearly diminished is the wrong word but. yeah I think I, it changed while it was there and I and the other thing is you know you develop a rapport with the guides or at least I, I did I made an effort to get to know them and you saw them loosening up and having a drink with you and chatting away and they showed a genuine interest in your country. You know, one of the guys was asking me all about politics in, in the UK. You know, so he brought it up. So this idea that somehow you can't talk about politics, you can't talk about democracy with a North Korean, that clearly wasn't true. I was telling him about how uh, Theresa May was the new UK Prime Minister and would replace David Cameron. There was going to be an election in the US and it was going to be Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. He couldn't understand how I didn't know who was going to win the US election. He <laughs> really? couldn't understand that this was an open question. <laughs> um, you know, so I, I'd say to him, yeah, you know, when in January, you know, or, or in December, in January, ask the American tourists, who is the new president? And he said, well, why can't you tell me now? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's an election. Yeah. People have to choose. For, but... Um, but yeah, so you, you know, and you you start you start to realise, you know, that that you know, well, the point is that the, the guides are are ordinary people, and they have certain rules that they have to follow. But I think they, they, my impression was that the motivation, really, more than anything, was to prevent <coughs> North Koreans from um, receiving any of our propaganda or being influenced too much by us, and for us to get a good impression of the country. And to go back home and say how great North Korea was and that everyone should visit. So talk to me about the guys, because you, you <coughs> clearly warm to them as people, which I think is quite interesting, you got to know them as people, rather than just what I think people would imagine going in, faceless, you know, party line towing, bureaucratic. They, 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 they weren't that to a certain extent. Well, yeah, they, they're definitely not faceless people. I mean, yeah, you, 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 know, you are talking about... They were people who were there to, you know, earn some money and, and to do a job. And it must um, be quite a good job, I'd imagine, as well. Like you... Yes. I mean, this was, this was my impression, actually, is because is, we, we, we all, you know, you, you give tips as well. You leave tips afterwards. And, um, you know, when you work that out in North Korean money, you're talking a lot, a very generous amount of money compared to what I was led to believe the average North Korean earns. So the guides can't be doing that badly. I mean, for all I know, they have to take this back and share it with the, with back. With, they give it all back to the government or something. I'm not sure, yeah. but <clears throat> you know. And as far as put it this way, the other thing was as far as North Korean jobs go, I think it's a nice little number simply because it you know anything could be, it's got to be better than the backbreaking work we saw people doing in the countryside mm. or the the military personnel who were building uh, all over the place. Mm. You know, without heart safety harnesses and that kind of thing. And um, you know, or some of the the other all the other boring jobs that that, that, that you see people do, you know, that machines do in our country. Mm. So I don't think you know. I th- whereas the tour guides, they get to take you around, they get to interact with a whole load of, of people from different parts of the world. And while 
I don't think they get many days off. I think they have to work very hard for it. I think compared to the standard, the, the standard of work, the, uh, the quality of work of the other people have to do in North Korea, I don't think it, it's that bad, no. <coughs> now, yes, we did, you know, I, I certainly did warm to the guides and got on with them and I played table tennis with them and pool with them and, you know, drank North Korean beer with them and had lots of conversations with them. Um, that said, you know, it's important to remember these are, you know, they are an elite in North Korean society and more than anybody else, they are going to have access to uh, the ideas and the media and uh, have a much better idea of what's going on in the outside world. Um, and yet they are, you know, and they're still going along with all of this. Um, I'm not going to say, oh, they could do any other job, but they, they are, they are, you know, they, they are, they are still doing the guide role and fulfilling their, their their duties there, and sometimes having to tell you, let's face it, outright lies. And I think they must know sometimes that mm. these are outright lies. But in my mind, I thought, and again, maybe I'm just maybe I'm totally ignorant about this, but I think you have a choice as a guide, just like just like people throughout history have had a choice when conform when dealing with totalitarian regimes. There's a difference between tacitly going along with something under threat and being a huge champion of uh, mm. that mm. threat yeah. and that oppressive regime. And I do it all the time at work. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There yeah. you go. And, and, and I saw both types of personality among the guys. You know, there, there, were, yeah. there were those who were there who were con- conforming to the rules and clearly doing their job and, and doing a very good job. You know, if I was a North Korean government, I'd definitely employ them. Uh-huh. Um, and then there were others who would go the extra mile and would want to tell you how there were no jails in their country and how you know yeah. the country was very rich and uh, you know things were a lot better than in the evil West. Mm. And is that did that correlate to a degree of seniority? Do you think, or or do you, do you just get different people who believe in things to a different extent? I don't. I don't know. I think. Uh, maybe maybe some of them maybe some of them hope to progress within the workers' party or something else. I honestly could I couldn't say. I honestly couldn't say. I suppose what my point is that there's e- even within an oppressive system like that, a totalitarian system like that, you have a choice about. There is a there seem to be a certain amount of flexibility uh, in in how much you conform, how much you go along with it. Mm-hmm. And actually, I was thinking as with so many things. In North Korea, you make the analogy with Nazi Germany, you know, uh, in the sense that, you know, at the Nuremberg trials and everything, and when people were trying to depict the Holocaust and figure out how this had happened, there were, you know, there were, there were plenty of people who said, well, I was just following orders. I had to do this or, you know, I would have been killed if I didn't, you know, if I didn't kill all of these Jews or take part in, in, in the horrific crimes that took place. Um, but then there were others who were able to say, well, actually, no, you know, it's well known that if you had objections to this or if you didn't, you couldn't stomach it or didn't feel able to do it, you could be transferred to some back office job or to something away from, from mm. that or, you know, to, to you know, doing, doing some kind of different role within the camp or outside of the camp. Um, and then, and, and which meant that a lot of the people who were doing the, the, the final stuff, putting the gas pellets in or, mm. you know, um, mm keeping the prisoners in check a lot of these people were just sadistic and were just doing it for uh for the worst kind of reasons you know and, and, and were true believers if you like now you know that's that's an extreme example but actually i think the level of thought control in north korea which is sustained by the whole system including the actions of the guys i think it's a horrific crime against humanity and you know you, you you're either conform you're either a full-blooded supporter of that that's perpetuating it or you're trying to take as much of a backseat as possible, not cause trouble for you and your family, but equally not going out of your way to, to ensure its survival as well. Yeah. I think that's so interesting. I mean, you, as you know, I'm sort of kind of left of centre politics, but I don't readily subscribe to too many ideas about, you know, liberty being a fundamental principle as opposed to kind of collectivism. But what it seems to me is, Regimes like that, when they're so state-oriented and so about collectivism, they say very quickly and very ably just delegitimise individuals, don't they? And, yeah. and, and people stop looking at people. You read some of the stories about North Korean guards in camps, you know, Shindon Hwok and people who've escaped from Camp 14 and places like that, will, they will say that they had no problem with it, with the statistic torture, 
because they did not view them as human beings or individuals. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's tragic. Mm. I want to ask you about your tea towels. Okay. Um, <laughs> because one of the stories that I liked that you told was how uh, you, you you took someone up and left them there, effectively. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, tell, <coughs> tell that story, because I just think this is brilliant. Well, I had... I. We previously mentioned uh, my company RadicalTeaTowel.com and we make kind of politically themed tea towels and political gifts in general and I'd just come back from a conference in the US because we, we, we'd like to you know make more um, designs based on American political figures and sell more of these things in America and, and so I had a bunch of these tea towels in my case and so it came time to leave and I thought, well, I'll, you know, we, 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 people were giving gifts as a thank you to the guides who'd shown us around. And so I thought, well, I'll, I'll give them some of my tea towels. You know, it was gifts from your home country, that kind of thing, that, 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 that you couldn't, stuff you couldn't get in North them. Korea. So other people were giving them, you know, short bread or, yeah. um, uh, you know, um, what, what would be other examples? Yeah, the, the, your kind of traditional yeah. cuisine, whiskey cuisines, whatever, yeah. yeah, whiskey, oh, cigarettes and things yeah. like that as well, because apparently Chinese cigarettes are much nicer than the North Korean ones, supposedly. Uh, so, yes, it was a, a real mix of stuff, cosmetics, that kind of thing. And I left some tea towels, I left them, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks and Maya Angelou, all of, <laughs> all of which happened to be in my case. And did they know, did they conceive of what these were at all? Did I, did, I didn't get to see the reaction because uh, we, we pulled all the gifts. I see. And then... And, then, uh, and, and then again, so them. there is a, presumably, uh, chicken noodle soup being served up some flat in Pyongyang <laughs> on, <laughs> on what I like to, What I like to think is that in somebody's kitchen, in some awful Soviet era high-rise in Pyongyang, there was a, a Martin Luther King tea towel with a, with an inspirational quotation. We we must learn to live together as brothers or perish together as fools. That that is hanging in somebody's kitchen somewhere, and that somebody is asking, "Who's that man? Or well, what's that about?" That, that that I would love that. For all I know, they've been burnt and <laughs> had to be thrown away because of being western propaganda or something i don't know so who, who who knows well in every kitchen also of course is a picture of kim jong-il and kim jong-un yes uh, yes and Long who knows side. hopefully that tea towel will last a bit longer <laughs> well know. yes well the, the funny thing the funny thing is of course that the tea towels are doubly controversial not only because they are well they're controversial on so many levels because they they're commenting on on politics and in generally a fairly liberal manner uh but they're also they also refer to a website on them, radicaltetail dot com, uh, is 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 put on every one of our products. And of course, North Koreans don't have the internet, so they're probably not meant to be seeing that kind of thing. But on top of that, the three characters I've left them: Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, and uh, Maya Angelou. Uh, they're all African Americans, as well, and uh, which is ironic, really, because uh, North Korea is essentially a racist state. You know, you're not. Uh, you, you, really, you don't see people who are of non-Korean uh, ethnic origin in the country, uh, other than tourists, of course. And uh, my understanding is that you know, North Korean women who have had children or, or uh, have become pregnant from Chinese men uh, have been uh, forced to have abortions um, by the authorities over there. So. This is not a country that supports racial diversity, I would say, or is uh, uh, particularly in tune with the, the civil rights movement that has uh, gained so much ground in the rest of the world. So there's, a, there's additional irony there. But. That is wonderful. <laughs> right, I've got four other themes, if I can. I want to. So the first one is a story about dancing that you told. And... and, it, and and I think I'm right in saying it was at the same time when, bizarrely, um, you were allowed to walk 500 metres odd through the streets of Pyongyang to go to the toilet by yourself for the first time in a very long time, having drunk too much beer number two. Uh, well, I want to clarify that I wasn't necessarily allowed to do that. Uh-huh. We, we went to a mass dance. Uh, North Koreans are really into this, this mass coordinated dancing and I got the impression watching this dance and 
drinking our North Korean number two beer, that the, the essentially they, the students dancing along, they didn't look like they were particularly enjoying it. They looked like they were doing it especially for us and that there were other things they'd probably rather be doing. There weren't many locals watching. This was all for tourists. Um, and, and I felt a bit sorry for them, to be honest, um, just standing there watching them. Anyway, after a, a while, nature calls, as it often does when you're drinking lots of lager. And um, I, I turned to the guide who was with me and I said, I, I assume that the nearest toilet is over in you know, the hotel that, we, that, we'd been, that we'd got the beers from earlier on. And he said, yeah, that he thought it was. And I said, anyway, see you later, and walked off. Now, I, that was not direct permission as such. And certainly, I noticed while I was walking over to this hotel that everybody else going in that direction had a guide with them. The, the few people who were going over there had a guide with them. And so I'd be walking past, uh, mostly through a huge par- car park, but also down the street uh, and in Pyongyang, and there'd be this long line of people at the bus stop, all of whom were looking at me funny. That was the time when I did get a strange look, probably because I wasn't with a guide, and they're not used to seeing people, the locals are not used to people seeing people on the streets. How far are you walking away? From... I walked about 500 metres uh, from, from the area of the dance to the hotel where I, where I visited the toilet. Uh, I met a German guy in the toilet who, who asked me where my guide was, because his one was waiting outside. I said I didn't have one. Uh, and then I walked past and just, I mean, you just kept going as if, as if I knew where I was going or just kept going as if, uh, this was perfectly allowable and, uh, and then rejoined the dance and that was it. And, um, and, and I met some other people from my group who'd be, still been waiting half an hour to get permission to go to the toilet apparently <laughs> from, from their guide. So I thought, oh, well, I just did it. <laughs> well, whoops, maybe, maybe I shouldn't have done that. You were conscious of what you were doing. I, I was conscious I was pushing the line a bit, but I also knew that I had an excuse, which is nobody had told me that I needed permission yeah. to go to the toilet. And, 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 and you this rely is... very readily on on the logic of your argument in a way that yeah. I don't think I would. I just think, because, you know, you, like with the money, you were saying, oh, I didn't know it was in there. Well, couldn't give a fuck if it was in there or not. Like, I, you know, <laughs> it would have been my... But that, that's because I think, actually, my impression was right from the beginning, the North Koreans... And, and this this actually... This possibly is is a way that my opinion has changed by going to North Korea. Is we the when we read about North Korea in, in our newspapers, we do get the impression that we're dealing with some kind of totally errant child here that just lashes out at random and has there's no logic or rationality to their actions and behaviour. And actually, I think there is a logic to all of this. Sometimes you can't always figure it out. I think underlying uh, things. There, there is there's a logic to how the, the to the way that the the regime behaves and and they behave in a way as to ensure regime preservation that's what it's all about but that filters down as well in the sense that you know there are rules and regulations that you should follow but as a tourist you're not necessarily expected to know them and if you're not you're told beforehand about the importance of respecting the leadership you're told beforehand about you know dressing smartly at this particular occasion or uh, whatever else, uh, and then there are certain things that seem to be left left out. You know, when I was at the at the DMZ and I was sending this text message to my mother, it was under the nose of a South of a North Korean soldier who was blocking off that corner of the balcony. My understanding was because he didn't want people to get mobile signal there, and yet he wasn't stopping any of us who were still texting away from sending messages. He was following the exact letter of the rule, which was to not let anybody go into that corner of the balcony. You know, it was. I, I don't think there's there's always a logic. Maybe I'm doing, um, I'm I'm sure I'm I'm doing some people a dis uh, a disservice, but th- I, there's not always the, the 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 logic of understand of themselves understanding the purpose mm. behind the rule necessarily. It's just this is the rule, and therefore follow it. And so I got the impression that if I'd have said, well, actually, I didn't realise I was meant to take a yeah. a guy with me to the toilet, uh, that 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 would have been okay. That would have been all right. I mean, to be frank, I was I'm I'm the kind of I I really value my freedom in the West, and uh, you know I don't like people telling me what to do in this country, and and after several days of that in North Korea and that that oppressiveness, I was really just longing for a walk, just to walk down the street by myself, more than anything. That that need was there just as much as my need to empty my bladder. To be frank, although that was pretty strong too. So those combined <laughs> meant I didn't have time to ask anyone's permission. I was off. So tell me then how it felt when you left finally. 
Yeah. What, left the toilet? Or no, 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 well, <laughs> you didn't tell me that if you wish, but when you, left, when you, when you eventually crossed the border back with China. I, I, there, was, there was definitely a sense of relief, because you know, despite the, the examples I've given you of where I tested the authority a bit or, or took a few risks, despite all of that, there was always a part of me that thought who knows what's going to catch up with me on the border who knows whether my passport's going to get taken away it's going to get inspected and the message is going to come down from Pyongyang saying aha Mm. uh, you know we've caught him out for doing this and there's always a part of your brain that thinks maybe that would happen maybe somebody just to mess with you is leaving it until the last minute just before you leave the country and so to get through without without any incident, to get through with that basic check of your bag again and your passport's taken away and none of your photos have been deleted. And so that, and then to cross that bridge over to China again and get through, crucially, get back through Chinese border control as well because if the Chinese don't want to let you in then you're stuck in North Korea, aren't you? To get through all of that was a massive sense of relief. And I don't say that because I regretted being in North Korea or didn't enjoy the experience or get a huge amount out of it. But there was definitely a palpable sense of, of being back in a place of relative freedom. Is reunification ever going to happen, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's, that's a grand question. Yeah. Not for me. I, I hope so. I hope so, but it's, it's, re- it's really problematic. You see, I think the, uh, the separation of the countries explains so much about North Korea and how it is the way it is and why the regime survived, actually. Mm. I read an argument before going... And I think this is true, which said that one of the reasons that the regime survives, unlike those in Eastern Europe and Russia and all the other places which have had dictatorships, which have eventually collapsed, is in other countries, the elites at the top of the communist regime or or, or fascist dictatorship or whatever, the elites concluded at some point that they would be just as well off or even better off under a more democratic system or capitalist system. And so they allowed change to happen, recognising that they would still have a privileged place in society within that country, mm. or would still be, you know, still maintain their, 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 their worth, their value within under a new regime. That's not the case in North Korea, because the, the fall of the regime there, which regime change in North Korea, means inevitably reunification with South Korea. The countries want to be a part of each other, and, and that's what would end up happening. And that poses a, a huge problem for a, the elite of North Korean society because South Korea is an extremely well-developed country with its own elite, pre-existing elite, its own heads of civil service, its own business people who will rapidly expand into North Korea and a, you know, a, a highly educated population. The, you know, the majority of South Korea's population, in my understanding, is certain among the younger generations, have been to university more than in a lot of other countries on earth. And so what jobs are unqualified, relatively uneducated North Koreans going to be doing in that new economy? They're going to be bottom of the pile. So if you are, for example, a government guide or a member of, you know, a wealthy family in Pyongyang or someone who has a connection to the leadership, Mm -hmm. you do not want change, you do not want unification in your heart of hearts. Um, You want to keep uh, the the, the system as it is because you are relatively well off in that situation. You've got enough food to feed yourself and and you are, you're, 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 you know, top of the pack as it were. And revolution in your model there assumes that that, 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 class of people, whatever you call them, the middle class almost, are essential to it going ahead. You know, you're not gonna you're not gonna have a peasant led revolt, say so you're gonna have people who are in the in the middle levels of government have got to I th- I think that's crucial, it. yeah. I mean you know, if you look at most I think if you look at most revolutions and rebellions that have taken place in history, you know, there have been alliances not just among working people, but among people on the inside of these regimes as well, and people higher up in the middle mm. classes. Um, it's it's not just pe- the people who are worse off, ironically enough. And that's no surprise, because, you know, your, your average North Korean farmer, he doesn't have access to, you know, you could, people in the countryside and people throughout the whole country were clearly, you know, getting a decent meal on the table was a priority. You, you knew that because people were very thin. I didn't see a single even slightly over, 
overweight person in my yeah. entire week in North Korea. Mm. The entire time. You know, obesity is totally unknown there. And, you know, so, uh, you know, you, first of all, people have got to have the energy. They've got to have access to weapons. They've got to organise. They've got to meet behind the scenes and everything. And uh, and my understanding is that the level there's of oppression... There's no technology like there is, with, say, the, what we saw in the, no, um, no, there isn't. the Arab Spring and things like that. There's they, no... they don't have Twitter to share ideas for this kind of thing. The internet to, to read about different techniques. There's very few visitors from outside and, yeah. uh, and, and, and information coming in. Although that's increasing, I think. I think therein lies the problem, doesn't it? Because, because the the survival of the regime, I think, is so dependent on its isolationism, and it's just becoming an anachronism. Like you know, with with like you were making the point in the beginning about USB sticks and things, and and folk have that, and, and DVDs and all those kind of things coming. You can't stand in the way of that forever, can you? <sighs> it's hard to say, you see, because people have you know called the death of the North Korean regime for a long time and it's not happened you know it seems to it keeps on surviving and despite this awful famine in the 90s you know that was a perfect moment for you know as, as Marx said you know that, that eventually people the workers will rise up because they can't feed themselves right and you'd have thought you know, when it gets to the point that you're either you're faced with death by starvation or death by doing something uh, against the regime or standing up, you might as well choose the latter. And yet mm. people don't. People didn't. Mm. Uh, that that things survived. You know, things went on as they always did. And we kind of. <clears throat> it's very easy when you're used to the level of freedom that you have in the West today, or even the relative freedom that people had in Eastern Europe in in the under communism. It's easy to say, well, why can't you know, don't people do this, or you know, why why shouldn't they? Uh, rebel against the regime how do they allow this to happen to themselves why do they tolerate it but when you're actually in it i think that the f- the fear was was palpable mm. i think because I, I, I think i'm not entirely sure about this but the communism in eastern europe for example though whilst there was great degrees of propaganda telling them you know you know like north korea nothing to envy it wasn't as isolationist was it in the yeah. same way it wasn't you know there were strange. cultural exchanges with the yeah. west yeah. Uh, Western tourists would come over. People would be able to post books in. My father posted a, um, a, a, a book. I think he, he was he even posted Animal Farm or something to mm-hmm. some people in Poland who'd asked for it specifically, and he had it hidden in a, in a copy of the Bible. I think it was. He he cut yeah. open a Bible and and posted that over. Um, but it's hard to them. You know, in North Korea, they're checking any any mail that comes into the country <laughs> is hugely <laughs> suspect. You know. <laughs> Yeah. Um, anyone who anyone who comes into the country is suspect. And I th- I can't remember what the stats are exactly, but it's some. Th- I'm not far off in saying when East Germany and West Germany came together, that the difference in GDP or whatever it was was about one to four or something east to west. Yeah. Whereas South Korea <coughs> to North Korea, we're talking one to twenty five, one to. 30. I think it. Yeah, it's a lot you know, more it's, extreme. It's yeah, it's and which is why a lot of people in the south are not too happy yeah. about reunification either I think that they it's a romantic ideal but in practical terms they recognize that they're gonna have to you know that, that they it, it could cause a huge recession a depression in the country because you know the, the the challenge of bringing up this extremely poor nation to South Korean standards of living is going to be huge mm. um, and it's you know you're talking about mass uh, immigra- uh, mass migration across the border across the yeah. country as well it's a huge, not to mention, actually, I think the biggest challenge with reunification is going to be the psychological element of it. Uh-huh. You know, from people who have escaped from North Korea, a lot of them have found it very hard adjusting in South Korea. This is what I've, I've heard anyway, despite the, psych, the, the support uh, and training and educational programs and even financial help that the South Korean government gives to North Korean defectors. A lot of people have really struggled with it. And... And that, you know, doing that for 22 million people mm. coming from North Korea, you know, tell, trying to re-educate people in their 50s who've been told their entire life that their leadership are semi-gods. And I, and, and I think you're right to say that it is a romantic idea rather than... So I remember going on a school exchange to Germany. This must have been, I was about 12 or 13, I guess. So what, we're talking 97, mm. roughly? Mm. Um and so what is that? That's five years after at least the wall has come down, longer, six, seven, eight years. Uh, and not the same by any matter of means. 
And this family I stayed with hated these Germans. <laughs> like, they really did. They said, oh, they're lazy, they're, you know, they drain on our economy, all these kind of things, even then. Yeah. And, yeah, I can, it's not going to be simply... I wonder sometimes if the solution is a managed... If what would happen is rather than it come to some sort of cataclysmic fall of the regime, that if it looked like it was heading that way, China would step in and almost almost manage a transit, do you know what I mean, would, would say, and it would be done in the language of the Communist Party of China is going in to assist the Communist Party of North Korea in a comradely fashion to help it transform its economy and, and the Kim family is... Well, what does China know. get out of that? Well, I think what China gets out of it, I mean, this is the major problem, isn't it, is the US presence there. I think were mm. South Korea not so heavily um, involved with the US militarily, you could see reunification potentially happening far quicker. Mm. But because there's that added dimension of it being a, effectively a US missile outpost right mm. next to the Chinese mm. border, the whole thing becomes hugely... Yes. I, can't, I cannot see how... I can see just about, I think, how Korean unification could happen. I cannot see how Korean unification with Chinese and American interests yes. can, can, can happen. And, and, this, and that, that's how it all started in the first place, of course, and... And that's the problem today is that, you know, for, for real change to happen, you do need the entire international community kind of speaking in unison about it. And that includes China. Uh, that said, I think, you know, China has been very critical of the North Koreans. They're, they're very worried about all these nuclear tests that are taking place. Yeah. And yet you know, the priority for North Korea is not keeping China happy. More than anything, it's it's just, you know, regime survival uh, in the immediate term. You've been incredibly tolerant. I've got one more question I'm going to ask you. I'm going to get on with your life. No, no worry about it anymore. Um, That's fine. And that is, so let me, be, let me be awful and just play devil's advocate here. Okay. How do you justify a trip like this? Haven't you just written a cheque for a £1,000 to Kim Jong-un? And that's a fair question to ask. I think that that's a question that, that's a point that a lot of people have made uh, and in the past. And it's certainly a question that I was asked uh, by certain people. I mean, look, first of all, um, the idea that all of your money, a thousand pounds plus or whatever you spend on this trip, goes straight into the pockets of North Korea's nuclear weapons program, always being used to fund torture equipment for people up in, in labor camps in the north, just can't be true from a practical point of view. There were a huge amount of costs associated in putting the trip on in the first place. I mean, you're followed, you, you, you've got you know, the permanent labor of the Western guides following you around, the North Koreans following you around, all your meals, all your hotel uh, costs um, and your travel costs, just on a practical basis, all of that needs covering um, in some way. I, I am sure that a certain proportion of my uh, of the amount I've spent on that trip uh, ends up in government coffers and I would trust the North Korean government to spend it a lot less than a lot of other places in the uh, in the world. Um, you know, that said, you, I'm also mindful that a certain amount of my taxes in the UK goes to causes that I, I disagree with, um, even if I don't have a problem with the with, with the regime as such. Mm. Um, not that I, I'm not trying to draw a, a, a complete equivalence between those things, but I think it's it's a point kind of you know worth bearing in mind that it's not a question of it, it it's a bit more it's not. It's certainly not. You've just handed one thousand, you know, a thousand pounds to um, completely evil people versus your money never goes to nefarious purposes when you're back here yeah. in, in in the UK. But more importantly than that, I think you know we we, we have a choice as tourists because some people would say you know it's just as bad just going there as a tourist. You know, it's, it's insulting to the North Koreans somehow. And what I would say is, we've got a choice. Either we block off North Korea entirely and we turn down their invitations for us as um, citizens of the world to go in there and visit um, and, 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 and interact with North Koreans, whether that's the guides, whether that's uh, people on the street and, uh, you know, or people working in the hotels or wherever else, or taxi drivers or whoever else we might meet out there. Either we turn that down and nobody from outside goes into North Korea at all and no North Korean ever gets to see an outsider. They don't get to see us turning up in our 
nice clothes and looking well fed and with our cameras and our mobile phones and looking like we're enjoying ourselves in our, in our lives. Either they don't see any of that at all and all they have is the interaction they get from the North Korean government or we go in and call it pathetic, call it far too subtle to be appreciated, whatever you want. But there's a certain amount of non-verbal communication going on there from the outside world uh, to the North Korean people. And I think that I'm not saying that that's going to cause a revolution tomorrow, um, but does regime, you know, if, if, if your goal is regime change or if your concern is human rights, um, is there more likely to be change uh, uh, slow, you know, will change happen quicker or slower because of people going into the country or not? You know, at best it's going to be neutral. I don't think we're prolonging the survival of the regime by going there. And the other point is, I think that, you know, the more people from the West that do visit there and the more that we have this kind of discussion and start talking about it, the more that North Korea is on people's map. You know, for me, before reading about this stuff and before visiting... I was vaguely aware that North Korea probably didn't treat its people that well, uh, but I've come back now, and I think there's a, there's there's there's, there's it, it's horrific what's happening out there. Actually, the mind control, the brain control of the people out there, and that that itself is one of the biggest crimes. I think just as much as any of the, uh, the, the physical violence uh, that we might have read about, and so that's something I think we need to talk about. We need to shout about, not run away from, not not close off entirely. Our college, we were at university, to its eternal shame, I thought, when we were there, had an offer of taking in two, I think, three maybe, North Korean students. Some guy, I can't remember the precise details of it, had, was sponsoring them and he also had some businesses over there and it was all linked in and, and it was voted down in a college council. I'm going to check this so I don't get done for libel before this goes out, but I think it was voted down at a college council thing and they chose not to do it. Right. And it's a real shame for me that supposedly one of the bastions of learning and liberal education in this country took the total opposite view to what you were just yeah, advocating. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, if we don't take these people in, if we don't, you know, if people aren't able to uh, have this communication uh, with the West, then you don't start to change people's minds. You know, what happened to those kids? Maybe they were able to find university places somewhere else in the world. I don't know. Uh, or maybe they had to get their educations in North Korea, but I can't imagine a lot worse than that. Final point to end on, you said in your emails that you got back to China and one of the saddest things was you suddenly saw and realised that you hadn't seen for a long time people just in their day-to-day -day lives smiling again. Yes. That really upset me, really. Yeah. But when I was in North Korea, I had to pinch myself a bit and I thought to myself, am I just distorting things? Am I having a rose... You know, am I remembering things back in London with rose-tinted spectacles or, or in China. Because, you know, let's face it, you travel on the London Underground and people look pretty miserable, don't they? You walk down the street and people can look quite annoyed. But actually, if you look carefully into office windows or in shops or people just talking on their mobile phones, you see people smiling, you see people laughing, you see people talking animatedly. They're even getting angry. Uh, they're, they're, just, they're reacting to the world around them and engaging with, with people and the world around them. Whereas everywhere we went in North Korea, you know, you, you barely n notice conversation. You, I did notice a few, ch when we went out to see a steel factory, which was somewhere outside the capital and a bit more remote, I saw some children cycling past with, you know, looking, you know, quite excited and, and quite, you know, and, and giggling to themselves. But as a rule, I didn't see people, you know, smiling and, and, and certainly, you know, not, hard, that's the thing, hardly interacting with each other. It was this really strange situation quiet, where I it, really. it was it was quite it was like zombies i mean that sounds horrible but it really was that's what it felt like anyway the only exception to that was when i would wave at people from outside the from the coach as we drove past i would i would spend a long time just raising my hand to people and just waving and and you you know a lot of people would just ignore you entirely Why but occasionally well, I just felt like for me it was a it was interesting to see people's reactions and to and to break the monotony of it, you know. And I kind of felt like it might be a it was a notable enough event for me when somebody waved back, you know. And you kind of you you felt the you felt the common humanity between you. I don't know. I think people on the bus probably thought I was stupid. Probably most of the North Koreans thought I was stupid. But actually, that was the the times when I saw true smiles. You know, as people would suddenly stop their work at the side of the road and then wave enthusiastically or. I remember we went past a bus in Pyongyang, a crowded trolley bus. And, you know, I saw the people looking out the window at our bus. 
uh, full of, of white tourists and and I waved at the bus and nobody waved back apart but there were two things that happened one guy sitting next to his girlfriend tried to lift his girlfriend's hand up to wave I think almost as a joke and then there was one man in the middle of the bus who wasn't waving himself but he was lifting lifting his daughter's hand his, his you know this baby daughter in his arms and he was lifting her hand and getting her to wave at me I've read a huge amount about different ideas about how they're going to do something to bring about regime change and reunification. Oh, yeah. And I think waving at children is the best idea I've heard yet, Luke. Yes. Seriously. So, <laughs> it was thank you so much. Thank you. Small for act of defiance. All of your time. I no, hugely, thank you, hugely Dave. appreciate it. It's absolutely brilliant.